Good evening and welcome to St. Barnabas as we remember and dare I say celebrate Good Friday and what Jesus has done for us and continues to do for us. This evening we have a prayer book service which is on page 276 of the Red Book of Common Prayer. Please stand as you're able. We begin this evening with a minute of silent meditation. Please kneel as you are able. on page 276. Blessed be our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, 
and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 22 is appointed for this evening, and that's found on page 610 of the Red Book of Common Prayer. We'll say this psalm antiphonally. I'll say the first half up to the asterisk if you would respond with the rest of the verse, page 610. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. Yet you are the Holy One. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They cried out to you and were delivered. But as for me, I am a worm and no man. All who see me laugh me to scorn. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. Many young bulls encircle me. They open wide their jaws at me. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They stare and gloat over me. Be not far away, O Lord. Save me from the sword. Save me from the lion's mouth. I will declare your name to my brethren. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will pour my 
The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the of the Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, all the my soul shall live for him, my descendants shall serve him. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and the full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from from an evil consonance and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the, the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please remain seated for the Passion reading. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to God. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Jesus, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, They answered him, Jesus Jesus said to them, Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, and they said, Jesus answered, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers, their captain and their officers of the Jews, seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the maid, 
who kept the door and brought Peter in. The maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are not you also one of this man's disciples? Peter said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, Jesus answering him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, Are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own accord, or did others say it to you? Did did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world to bear to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. 
Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier. But his tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. This was to fill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Please kneel as you're able for another minute of silent meditation. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Tonight we welcome Julie Shire. uh, Please be seated. Tonight we welcome Julie Shires back to our pulpit. Many of you know that you know that Julie is part of our diocesan preaching class. So welcome, Julie.
On April 10, 1998, British Prime Minister Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn, Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland, announced that a peace agreement had been reached and that all military actions and acts of terror in Northern Ireland would come to an end. For the Protestant Great Britain and the Catholic Irish Republic, the significance was not lost on the people of those nations. As this announcement came on Good Friday, and it was known as the Good Friday Agreement. Easter Sunday, two days later, was a usual joyous celebration, but there was no ignoring the elephant in the room. The peace accords presented at one point a beacon of hope, but it also stirred anxiety and fear in the hearts of the Catholic and Protestant Christians alike as to whether this peace, one of many broken peace promises, would actually hold. And although Northern Ireland issues had gone on for centuries, in the 30-year period from 1968 to 1998, it became known as the Troubles. And in that time, 3,700 people had died in the violence, 18,000 injured, 15,000 bombings, and 26,000 shootings had taken place. A British pastor once interviewed an Irish friend of his and asked him what it was that made the Irish problems so persistent. And the Irishman explained, well, it's like this, he said. Whenever the Irish get talking about religion, they get historical about it. And the pastor said, I think you mean hysterical. He says, no, no, I mean historical. They keep bringing up things that happened years and years ago. They will not bury the past. In 1998, Northern Ireland was paralyzed with fear and the economy brought to a standstill. There was a reluctant recognition that the continuing violence was not accomplishing the goals they had envisioned. With the Good Friday Agreement, the people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, all of them, were being asked to vote for their future. It took forgiveness on all sides of the conflict to bring the cessation of violence in Northern Ireland. It took faith to take a step into the, the unknown. And peace came at a tremendous personal cost to those who had lost family members. But this kind of forgiveness could probably never be possible without Christ's death on the cross. And of all the festivals in the Christian calendar, there is none that has more to teach us about forgiveness than Easter. Matthew 18.22, Jesus said that forgiveness doesn't keep a record of wrongs or counts how many times we must forgive. Matthew 5.42, you have heard that it was said, love your enemy, your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then famously, Jesus on the cross, one of the last words he said was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We have taken from our lectionary passages from the book of John in the past uh, six weeks or so. And Jesus made it very clear in the last half book of John that he knew that his time on earth was down to hours. And he counseled the disciples how he related to his father. He and his father were one, and what was to come was in his father's will. What does this kind of forgiveness mean to us as a church and a community and even as a nation? We sometimes overlook the fact that the events surrounding the capture, the trial, and execution of Jesus had powerful political overtones. The Jews, having similar religious roots, were, kind of like the Irish, very divided. There were the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and of course, then there was Jesus. 
Against the backdrop of his popularity, some Jewish leaders saw Jesus as a threat to their own authority. The Roman leadership had to contend with Jewish laws to determine what kind of threat this Jesus actually represented at the time. And in the end, most of the disciples fled, Jesus betrayed Jesus, and Peter famously denied he ever knew him. It was only the disciple John whom Jesus loved, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who mourned his death at the foot of the cross. In the days that followed, the disciples of Jesus saw their lives unravel. They did not have the benefit of a peace agreement or a roadmap of the future. But what they did have was a resurrected Christ. They met together, not, not to vote, but to try to understand the life of Jesus and his death and what the resurrection meant to their lives. The words of Jesus that were read tonight in John 1836 began to take hold in their hearts when it said, my kingdom is not of this world. In our own country today, polls show that there is a lot of fear and there is a lot of anxiety in what the near future will bring. As Christians, we are taught in Romans 12, 2, to not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Our national conversation is very divided, and our leaders rarely come up with any sort of an agreement or decision that speaks to meaningful problem solving. How can a so-called Christian nation, air quotes, be so at odds with itself? Are we not just as divided as perhaps the Irish people have been, or the Jewish people in the time of Christ? The context of Good Friday is a good time to remind ourselves that God's kingdom is in the world, but not of the world. God's forgiveness is for us, and Jesus modeled the forgiveness necessary to make real change in our world. And that kind of forgiveness only happens when we root out the hate from our hearts individually and replace it with love. The peace in Northern Ireland could only happen when individuals could forgive that past and put their hope in a peaceful future that was bigger than themselves. Nelson Mandela, who led the fight to dissolve apartheid in South Africa, spent nearly 30 years in prison. And he said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Forgiveness liberates the soul. It removes fear. That is why it's such a powerful weapon. There is no future, he said, without forgiveness. Could forgiveness be the transforming of our minds that Paul reminded us in Romans 12, 2, that Jesus talked about in his last hours? I used to have a small poster when as I was preparing for the sermon. I remembered that poster that I had, and it was a silhouette of two people embracing and superimposed on this background were the words, a modest proposal for peace. Let the Christians of the world agree that they will not kill each other. But I got to thinking, what if the 2.2 billion Christians in this world were to commit to forgive one person in the coming year? That doesn't sound like very much, but if you really think about it, how, much, how many of us hold on to things that should be forgiven, whether it's asking forgiveness from a five-year-old or a grandchild, or asking forgiveness from someone at work or a spouse, or maybe a cashier or somebody perhaps we were rude to in a store. I've done that, and I've asked for forgiveness. Could that humble step where every Christian were to forgive one person in the coming year lead to a groundswell of people longing for change like we saw in Northern Ireland, in South Africa? Could it happen here at home? 
When we commit to doing the difficult work of forgiveness, change begins in our homes, in our churches, at work, in our community, and in our nation. And in the end, after being scorned and beaten, humiliated, and left to die, Jesus' last words were words of forgiveness. In closing is a quote from Justin Holcomb, an Episcopal priest. He said this about Good Friday. Jesus endured the cross on Good Friday, knowing it led to his resurrection, our salvation, and the beginning of God's reign of righteousness and peace. Good Friday marked the day when wrath and mercy met at the cross. That's why Good Friday is so dark and so good. Peace be with us. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them for Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. <clears throat> Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, 
Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Good Friday devotions continue on page 281 with the responses as listed. We glory in your cross, O Lord. And praise the Lord by your holy resurrection. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. O Savior of the world, who by the, thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your gut judgment and our souls now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, 
and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen.